Obviously, every book in the Bible is an important book. Obviously, every book in the Bible has some spiritual relevance and is a truth from God. When we look at the book of John, however, John seems to stand out compared to a lot of the other books in terms of what it says, how hard hitting, how direct it is, uh, just the implications of what it says just really cannot be overlooked. And that's the book that oftentimes you go to to see a lot of hard theological truths that some people just don't want to accept. And the book of John just starts off. It's almost like it starts off at a 10 and stays there. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. Notice some of the the, the deep theological statements that are made here. And I think you can see why a lot of people actually love John. They would say that John is probably their better book. So much so that some people, when they first start reading, they might skip all the other books and start reading the Bible in John. So let's go there. In John 1, he says, strong statement, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, let's just go ahead and jump into it. What he is actually saying, he's going to reiterate this again. And he's saying that Jesus is God. Jesus is the word. We're going to see that in a second. And this Jesus, this word is God. And how do we know that? Well, a couple of things. We have what's called a predicate nominative here. And a predicate nominative, when you see that, you have the same thing in English. And in Greek, the predicate nominative describes the class or category to what the subject is. In this case, the first word that we come to, halagas, is the subject. So in our, in our came and halagas in the beginning was the word uh, and the word was with God and uh, prostan theon and was with God so with God in the very beginning was the word now that's not all that controversial until we get to clause three and it says kai theos and halagas now the way it's written I think is pretty interesting as a matter of fact I think it's wonderful and pretty clear and now notice the shift Instead of having the word, like in English, the word order and the word was God, but in Greek, the word order is and God, kai theos, was the word. Now, what it's really saying, and God was the word. In other words, the emphasis of what the word is, is shifted to the beginning. Because it's a predicate nominative, and in Greek, word order does not matter because we already know what the subject is, then we already know what that is the word and that the word is being described as or in the classification category as God. This is a pretty easy Greek rule to understand. It's not that difficult. There are some, though, who would want to disagree with the deity of Christ. But here it's pretty clear. And so unless John, unless, unless John doesn't know Greek, uh, unless this this uh, spirit breathed word is also grammatically incorrect. And we can trust what it's saying. That is Jesus is God. The word is God. And notice what he says. Now, there are going to be some that are going to say that, well, because this is an anarthrist, meaning that it doesn't have the, the definite article before it means that this is a God. But that that violates so many different things to say that the word was a God. But again, we can't have any other God before him. There are no other gods. As a matter of fact, God says, he says, of any other gods, I don't know of any. So there are no other gods. And there certainly can be no one that will take glory like he does, that will accept worship like he does, that will forgive sins like he does, or can pay a ransom for our life like he does. And so clearly, this is God. Now, going back to it, if we go to verse two, he says, he was in the beginning. Uh, that is God. Uh Hutas ain ain hain. I'm sorry, Hutas ain ain arke. So this one was in the beginning with God. So obviously that harkens back to Genesis 1. In the beginning was the and I'm sorry, in the beginning, uh God created. And notice the reason why I think it's also important is just looking at the grammatical uh context of this, the, gr the grammatical statement or how this is written, we see a plurality in the word. Uh, God Elohim in the in the Old Testament. Now, by itself, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. Uh, it can it can refer to a lot of things, but because we see how God has described Himself um, as this triune God, clearly that's the point that He's trying to make. Even in Genesis one one, and who was with Him in the beginning? Jesus, the Word. All things came into being through Him, just like it says in Colossians one fifteen. All things came into being through Him, that is through Jesus, and apart from Him. Nothing Ude was or came into being that has come to being. So there's nothing that exists that is here outside of Jesus. Without Jesus, it does not exist. In him 
was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, so what he's stating is, and we know this because how man is, how his life is, how he, how he sees he is, we are, we are born in darkness and we actually enjoy the darkness, but Jesus is the light who shines in darkness. The problem is the darkness is not comprehended. And many of us who are in darkness, we don't comprehend it. So we're going to need something to help us to comprehend this darkness. And he's going to tell us that in just a little bit. Now, obviously he doesn't fully flesh it out here in chapter one, because he's not giving us everything in just one chapter, All and which makes sense because this isn't about a chapter because we didn't have chapters and verses that was added much later. So uh, he, he's going to make his point very well, succinctly. So he says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. And look what he says. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light. Oftentimes in scriptures, when something's going to happen, we almost always see it. I'm saying almost always. I, I'm trying to think of a time where something happens, something significant something of such theological importance where there is nothing that precedes. There's no warning. There's no one kind of uh, making the way before that. Uh, we know what's going to happen with the children of Israel. Um, there's often these prophecies or God stating what is going to happen and someone to say so ahead of time. And so we see this here. And this is John fulfilling prophecy about this one coming to make the straight of uh, make way the straight for this person for, for Jesus. So he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. And so all the ones that will be believing, and it's important to look at this, this is a, 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 a eris active subjunctive, so this is might believe, so that all that might believe, they would do so through him. He came in order that all that might believe would do so through him, that's the point. Your belief must be based on, about, centered around, and through him through Jesus. He is the, he's the, the, the significant one. He is the point of emphasis here. And he says he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. I think it's pretty interesting also to say this because in the beginning, he says, let there be light. There was no sun, there was no moon. And so clearly the source of this light would be the Lord himself. He says, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. So what is he speaking of? Obviously, he's speaking about the Jews, about the children of Israel, about the, about the Jews who he came to them, and they didn't receive him. Now, he this was not a surprise. Obviously, this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. As a matter of fact, it was prophesied it was going to happen. We won't go to that just yet. But he came to them, and they didn't receive him. That's vitally important, because look at what he's going to say. He came to his own and those who were his own, the Jews did not receive him, but as many as received him. And this is pretty important. This word, hasoi, hasoi de alaban, which is but or and as many as. So that, that's all inclusive. That is to refer to whoever it is that received him. He's going to say not. Now, obviously, this is speaking of not just the Jews. This can't be just the Jews because he just said his own, that is the Jews, did not receive him. And so now he moves it to who, who, whoever it is that receives him, that would include Jews and Gentiles. So whoever it is or to all that it would that be received, that would receive him, to them he gave the right to what? Become children of God. And think about how he kind of makes a switch. Who were normally, who were previously called the children of God? The children of Israel. They These were the... These were to be the sons of God, the children of Israel. And so he makes he's making a shift. He's starting to enlarge it and make it so that everyone now would be known as the children of God. All of those who what who might believe through him. So if you happen to be believing uh, through him, then you're children of God, you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, it's because you are believing in or through him. And I think that's really, really significant. Now, it's always been that anyone could be part of. Uh, the children of God, even in the Old Testament, even under the law, all it simply required was someone who, again, believed in him or through him and would follow. Him. Now, you could do so following the law and you would take part in the covenant and so forth. But still, it was always open to non-Jews, even though, as Paul says, the oracles chiefly were instructed or, or were given to the Jews. And so he says that those have the right to become children of God, who those that are believing in him, even to those who believe in his name. So 
especially or moreover to those who believe in his name. And by the way, the word even, if you notice, is italicized here uh, because it's not there in the Greek. So to those, so that's really the focus, to those who were born, or I'm sorry, who believe in his name. And notice what he says in verse 13. This is um, salvifically important. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, I want to focus on this, but of God, but these are people who believe because they were born of, not of the not of blood, they weren't born because of blood, nor of the will of flesh, but look what he says, but ekthei which is they were out of God or from God, they have been born. And he uses this tense here. This is a plural eris passive indicative. Now, the reason for the, 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 the in, I mean, the passive part is because it was done to you. You being born, it's being done to you. Why do we say that? Well, a couple of things. First of all, go to John 3. Jesus says that uh, truly, true, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this born again is being born from above. This Ganethe Anothem is to be born from above. And he, and he says this three different ways. To be born from above, he goes on to say that born of water and spirit, verse 5, water and spirit. And then he says born of the spirit. And notice how he says it in verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it's come from or where it's going. So it is of everyone who was born of the spirit, again, born of the spirit. So all of those mean the same, born again, born of the spirit, born of water and spirit, born from above, that is born from heaven, born from above of the spirit. And so just like the wind blows where it wishes, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to. So it is of all of us who are born of God, or as he says in here in, in verse 13, ek theu, uh, which is of God or from God, you have been born. Now, the reason why this is also important is because going to 1 Peter 1, 3, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who caught, through his great mercy has caused us to be born again. So it's vitally important we understand our being born again. We weren't born of our own will, of flesh, of blood, but we were born of his will, of the will of God. God, he caused us to be born again. So I think that that's a that's an important statement that John is making here. And so we go to verse 14 and the word became flesh. And so God took on flesh, not that he manifested in flesh, that he went from being God, the father to becoming God, the son. That didn't happen. He's all God. The father exists eternally, just like God, the son. However, in this case, God, the son takes on flesh through his, through his incarnation, through Mary. And so now we see him became flesh and does what? Dwelt among us and we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace. Now, this couple of things that we need to point out here. One, the, the only one of its kind. So there's no one that can make this claim. Nobody ha is ever going to be able to make the claim that they are begotten of the father. Why do we say that? Because he said, or the only begotten of the father, because he says, and the word just simply means uh, monogenus, which is the only one of its kind. There cannot be two and then both of them be the only one of its kind or 20 and all 20 be the only one or a million and all t all one million be the only one of its kind. Only Christ can make this claim because he says he's um, uh, speaking about his glory, the glory as of the only one. Now, remember, God is clear. He's not going to share his glory with anyone. He says so in Isaiah, but then also Jesus, we see making having his prayer in John 17, which will come to at some point in time in the future. Jesus is praying, give me back the glory that I had with you where in the beginning. So he's clearly stating that he is God. You can't get around what John is trying to um, show us, the picture that, that John is trying to draw of Jesus to us, that Jesus is God. And so he says, verse 15, John testified about him and he cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me, which think about that. Now, John is a little bit older. He's a few months older. They're cousins, but he's a few months older. But he says he existed before me. Well, because he is God for of his fullness, we have all received and grace upon grace for the laws was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. All that was spoken of and Jesus makes a statement later that you search the scriptures. And that's a good thing because they speak of me. And so what was spoken of in the law is just pointing to Jesus. All of that 
that God wanted to impart to the Jews uh, is all now realized or actualized in Jesus. Now look at verse 18. Verse 18 is John reiter reiterating this important point about Jesus, about his deity. No one has seen God at any time. Well, the one person, that being Jesus, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is the bosom of the, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained. So he's kind of revealed himself uh, through the Son. Remember, God it reveals himself in various ways. He reveals himself, obviously, through nature. That's not enough for us to come to salvation, but he still reveals himself to let us know, hey, there's a God out here. Two, he reveals himself, obviously, in Scripture. To the extent that he wants to be known through Scriptures, he shows us. Has he fully revealed himself? No. And then, obviously, he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And so this is what he's saying here. But notice what he says, though. Not just... Um, someone speaking on behalf of God. He is God. He says the only begotten God. Look what it says. Monogonese theos. So he's calling God the only begotten, only one of his kind. And so that is obviously theologically important. This whole belief that Jesus is God is paramount to salvation. If you do not believe that he is God, you cannot be saved. Deuteronomy 4, 35 and 39 tells us that the Lord is God. There is no other Lord. There is no other Savior. According to Isaiah, look at 42 and 43. There is no other Savior. There is no other God. There is no other name uh, under heaven whereby men can be saved, according to uh, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, Philippians. And so he's making a, a statement. And then Paul says in, in Romans 10 that you must confess that he is Lord and not just a Lord, the Lord, um, Salvation is found only in the name of the Lord. So whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We've got one faith, one baptism. We've got one Lord. And so it's paramount to believe that your faith in what he's done is your faith in the Lord, who is God, who has come to pay a debt for us that we could not pay. Verse 19. This is testimony of, of, of John. When the Jews sent him, I'm so sorry, sent, sent him, uh, sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, who are you? And he confessed, I did not know. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't and did not deny, but confess, I am the Christ. They asked him, what then are you? Elijah. And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. They said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet says. So now they're asking him, who exactly are you? Uh, are you the Christ? No. Are you the Messiah? No. Are you one of the prophets? No. Are you Elijah? No. Now, some are going to want to ask a question about this issue about John being Elijah because there seems to be some discrepancy what was meant when Jesus says about, uh, and, and if you believe he is the Elijah to come. Well, I won't cover just now, but you can go and check this out in the video that I, that I did about is John Elijah, what's meant by that. So I'll let you guys on your own time go and check out that particular video. But in the meantime, uh, what does he say? He says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make way, uh, make the way of the Lord straight. Now notice he says, I am a voice. He is a voice to the word. Here, here comes the word. Notice the imagery, the words that are used here. The word and then the voice. This voice is laying straight, making straight the path of the word. Verse 24. Now they, they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him and said to him, why are you baptizing if you are not the Christ? nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered him saying, I baptize. And notice this, this is pretty interesting how he says this and what he says. I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. And remember, he says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Uh, verse 27, it is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptized. Remember, they come to him and they want to be baptized. He says, you brood of vipers, what fruits of repentance do you bring? And so they were hostile towards him, but they want to be part of the end thing. But John recognized, no, this isn't about you and your and your cloud and so forth. This is about the one who, who was promised, who is to come. Now, af as he's baptizing, he's going to give some more information because some people say, well, we should get baptized because Jesus got baptized. Well, we're not getting baptized for the same reason that Jesus got baptized. And you don't tell us this. The next day, Je Jesus, I'm sorry, he saw J Jesus coming to him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, that is important to what he said. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, where does that come from? Well, this comes from Leviticus. We have what's called the Day of Atonement. We have these sin offerings also, but there is an offering given to take away the sin of the people. Leviticus 16, 15, uh, speaking about what the priest should do, then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, uh, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil and do uh, with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull. Now, in other words, under the old covenant, there was a sin offering given to pay the debt of the people that were owed to God. You also have a uh, an, an escape goat who would take the sins and would carry the sins away to uh, uh, in a faraway land. So Jesus is going to play the part of both of those. As a matter of fact, he's going to play the part of the high priest as well. Now, in terms of taking away sin, a couple of things. One, he's going to take away, pay, pay the debt so the sin can't be remembered again. But also the sin of the people are pronounced on his head. He is going to be the sin uh, the sin bearer, so to speak. And so whatever the people sin were, they are counted and, and put upon his head and sent away. In the same way, Jesus does the same thing. Uh, and really in both regards, as a sin offering and as the scapegoat. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Now remember, this is important. Those offerings can never take away sins. What are they offered for? Well, they're offered for sin. But I just, I, but didn't just say it can never take away sin? No, it can never fully take away sins, even though it is a, it's a temporary covering um, and a temporary atonement for sin. That's a problem, though. It can never take them away. And so what is Jesus coming to do? Take away sin forever. So there's going to be an offering of uh, force our sin once and for all, which is why he goes on to say later on in chapter 10, he says, now where there is forgiveness of these sins or these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. And so Jesus is going to take care of that. There will no longer be any offering. There will no longer be a scapegoat needed. But what Jesus is doing, he's doing uh, for the sake of the people. So when he says, behold, John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that's important. That is important. Now, is he taking away everyone's sin? He's making it available for everyone's sin to be taken away from. And so his job, what he's going to do is, again, play the role of two, the scapegoat, as well as the sin offering to take away sin. Uh, pity on the person who doesn't understand that, who doesn't know that, who doesn't care about that, and who disregards that. But that's his that's his purpose. This is he on whom, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. John said something kind of interesting. He said, I did not recognize him. Well, wait a second. This is your cousin. What do you mean? Well, his point is not that he didn't know him. He didn't understand his face. He knows who that is. Obviously, he had to because he says, look, everybody, here's Jesus. Here's the Lamb of God. So he had to know who he was. But he want, but but to be sure, uh, I did not recognize him. But so that he might be manifested or revealed to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Why is that? Well, so that everyone would know and that there'd be a testimony uh, about this. He's baptized. Now he's doing it for two reasons. One, uh, that they agree that they have sin. So you're being baptized as a remission of your sin. Is it taking away sin? No, but it's you making a declaration that I've got sin. I needed to be taken. I need to be washed clean. But then also a bigger point is that he's baptizing people. And guess what? When he baptizes those people and they come up, nothing baptizes again, nothing. Here comes Jesus. He baptizes Jesus. What happens? The, the spirit descends on him like a dove. A voice from heaven comes. Now, remember, uh, John is doing this when Jesus first shows up to John. John, obviously, because he knows him, I, he says, I need to be baptized by you. So, obviously, John understands who he is. And so, 32, John testifies saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to him, said to me, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Let's pause there for as well. He is going to come to baptize in the Holy Spirit. Why is that important? Well, because unless there is uh, us receiving the Holy Spirit, we are not his. We are children of God if we have the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes that statement himself in Acts 1. One, speaking to the apostles, John makes a statement, I baptize you with water, but one comes after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. 
Then Jesus reiterates that in Acts 1, 4. Uh, I'm sorry, 1, 5. He says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And we're told that all believers have been baptized in the Spirit. So our profession of faith and us being born again or us being born again causes this profession of faith and we become believing um, souls. We are baptized into the spirit. We don't baptize ourselves in the spirit, nor can anyone else. If anyone else were to come and say that by the laying on of their hands or they are the cause, they're the ones that are that's bringing about the Holy Spirit. That's not true. As a matter of fact, it's borderline blasphemous, if not completely blasphemous. Why? Because the Bible is telling us here it's Jesus who is going to be the one that's going to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. So if, if you're looking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's a Jesus thing, not a you thing. And that is done upon the profession of your faith. If you, if it's upon true, genuine faith, the Lord baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. The identifying mark of every believer is the Holy Spirit. And so he baptizes them or all believers, us with the Holy Spirit. So going back to John 1, he says, I myself uh, have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. And the Son of God, this is not a not a basic statement. This is a statement to state who he is, uh, his identity, his deity. 35, again, the next day, John was standing with his two disciples. Now, this part is interesting. Uh, I used to give this kind of as a riddle, as a test. And the test goes something like this, or the riddle. When Jesus calls his first disciples, how did it happen? Now, you think about it when you read in Matthew. Now, the first the first three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they give two different accounts. Two of the Gospels state that Jesus is walking alongside. Matter of fact, let's go to Matthew 4. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. That's an awful lot for someone to just get up, leave their nets, and just follow him. Well, why would they do so? Now, is this the order? And that's the question. What's the order of, of him calling? Because another account and the other gospel says that Jesus pulled up to them while they were in their boats, and he speaks to Peter, and he says, gets in the boat as he's preaching to the people, and he says, push out. Uh, and cash, and he says, we haven't caught anything all night. Now, remember, they fish at night, but Peter, I mean, but Jesus is there saying, no, this, even though it's the daytime, um, push out further deep. Now they fish, they, they fish in shallower waters, but Jesus wants to go further out into the deep. Jesus, I would say, you're not a fisherman. This is my craft. I know what I'm doing, not you. So why, why would I listen to you? But what is, what is Peter's response? He says, uh, we have caught, we haven't caught anything all night, but nevertheless, because you say so. You, Lord, say so. Then I'll do so. And then he, after this great catch comes in, he worships and he understands who he is. Well, why would he do that? Why would one, he just get up and just follow uh, Jesus? Is Jesus walking around, walking on the edge of the sea, calling out to them, saying, come, I'll make you fishers of men. Are they just walking off to follow some stranger? No. Are they just letting some stranger get into the boat? And one, preach to the people then tell them to get out and go fish the way I want you to fish would you do that no they're not doing it to some stranger they're doing it to someone who they have already met and they have a relationship with it so in order to understand the chronology of how he calls first disciples you go with John first and then work your way back so instead of reading Matthew Mark Luke and John you read John Luke Mark and Matthew or Matthew Mark so you go back from the first I mean from the last to the first and that gives you the order so as we go back to this passage in John 1 we can begin to see what he's saying. So 35, again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, who were his two disciples. And he looked at Jesus and said, as he walked and he said, behold, the Lamb of God, the two of the disciples heard him speak. They followed Jesus and Jesus turned and, and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, to them come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was standing and they stayed with him that day for it was about a tenth of the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's brother, Simon Peter's brother. He found his, his brother, Simon, and said, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. So in other words, they were already waiting for him. So 
it seems to be that Peter, Simon was also a disciple of John. He just wasn't there when, when Andrew was there. And so Andrew goes and gets his brother. We found him. Well, you found who? Well, apparently we were looking for him as well. So we found him. He brought him, that is Peter, to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. Now, again, it's important. So this is how he find, he is getting his disciples together. And so after he meets Peter and Andrew and obviously James and John, then he can come back later and say, push out to the deep. Then he can come back later and says, follow me. The next day, verse 43, he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So this Jesus was spoken of previously. Now everything that was spoken of is now beginning to transpire. Uh, this is Jesus, son of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see then. You don't believe so? You don't, you're not sure? Well, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said, How do you know me? Do you know who I am? Do, do I know you? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Now Nathanael's impressed. He's intrigued. Um, Rabbi, you are, look what he says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. This is understood. Now remember, to make that statement, son of God and king of Israel refers back to one, what was spoken of in the Old Testament. And then this, this uh, king of Israel, well, they've been waiting for this king of Israel from Genesis 49, to when it says the scepter shall not depart from, from Judah through all up to second Samuel seven about this king that's going to sit on the throne forever, uh, the Davidic covenant. And so here he's making a statement. This is, this is a big important statement that he's saying, how he's saying it. Jesus answered and said to him, because I have said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And definitely they will. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, where does he get that from? That's an odd thing to say. Well, he gets this from Genesis 28. Genesis 28, this is Jacob having a dream and he came to a certain place and he spent the night there because the sun had set. Now let's drop down to verse 28. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were descending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. Now let's stop there. Notice what he says, though. He says, I am the Lord. Remember, a little bit further. He says, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. Surely the Lord is in this place. When Jacob wakes up, he says this. So now he's called the Lord. Understand this is Yahweh. He is called the Lord. So this dream that he's having, these angels are descending and ascending. And notice what he says. He says uh, in verse 12, the angels of God were descending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord, this is the Lord, Yahweh, stood above it and said, I am the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your father, Abraham. Now, when John makes, or when it's made in this statement to Nathaniel, what is Jesus saying? He says, truly, truly, I said, you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. So he calls himself the son of man. He's the son of God. He's the king of Israel. And these angels are ascending and descending. So what is Jesus saying? He's letting them know that I am God. There can be no other way to take this. So now, how rich is this particular chapter? As rich as it, as it can get. He speaks about our salvation, how it comes about. He speaks about who is the epicenter of our salvation as Jesus, who causes it, who brings it about. And by believing in him, we have salvation. He makes it clear that he is God in the beginning of the chapter, the middle, and at the end. And then about our salvation and so he says, and now he, he, he says something that's pretty, pretty intriguing, though. You'll see greater signs than these. And boy, will they. So this particular chapter of John 1, and it's just John 1. We haven't got to the other chapters. There's some other passages that are they're just highlights. When you think of some of the highlights of the book, now, obviously, the whole book is just a wonderful book. But chapter 3, 
what we're going to talk about as, as far as being born again and so forth. And then the world, the most famous passage ever in the Bible, John 3, 16 is in John 3. Uh, John 4, the woman at the well. How about John 6, speaking about salvation and how we got got our salvation, how we got to be brought to him. How about John 8, where he's declaring specifically that he is God and without you believing that you cannot be saved. How about John 10, where he tells us about us as sheep and how uh, what sheep are going to do and that us as sheep want what we are. We were given to him and that we will never depart from him. We'll never turn away. Uh, how about even John 11, where he's having this conversation with Mary and Martha about Lazarus asking, him, do you believe? And he's asking this in a, in a kind of a, uh, a probing way. Or how about John 12, where he speaks about being lifted up? Or what about John 15? He's preparing John 14 and 15. He's speaking about his 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 upcoming death. Uh, and he said that he's going to prepare a place for them. And then John 15, he says that I have placed you um, in, a, in a place to where you are going to benefit, where you are going to bear fruit. You're going to remain and bear fruit. How about John 17 as he's praying, getting ready for his death? How about John 19, where he says, the famous pastor, it is finished. And John 20, 20, and he's giving his instructions as he's getting ready to leave about them. And so the entire book is amazing, but he starts off in John 1 by first declaring who he is. I'm God and in me salvation is there. There will be no other need for another sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. And so for that reason, John 1 is just an awesome book. Amen.